in 2013, I wrote a book called The Political and Economic History of the Jews of Afghanistan at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. You know, Afghanistan is a buffer between the Russian and the British Empire. It was very important to Britain. So they paid a lot of attention to what was happening there. Um, and I went into, into the archives, actually the London Metropolitan Archives, and I found this story of a young woman named Tova, who was 12, 13 years old, who had been kidnapped. And, and her father wrote a letter that was a plea to try to save her. And I read the letter, and then I just put my head down on the table and cried. And it was, it was just, it was just heart wrenching, um, her situation. And that sort of got me on the path to study what happened to the Afghan Jews, the Jews, of, the Jews of Afghanistan, and what, what, what was, what had happened to them? Where were they? Um, the, why was their history so short? You know, what had been going on? And eventually I learned that Toba had been saved um, and she was able to be rescued and eventually she immigrated to Israel. Um, but I didn't find that out for many years. Um, and then, so then I started to, to read uh, the letters that Afghan and Bukharan traders who were, resident, who were living in London wrote to the British government, to the Jewish, um, uh, the board of deputies of British Jews, to, to trying to get help as best they could for their relatives and, and their countrymen who were in Afghanistan and really suffering. And, and I, I, I read the letters and then I went to various archives and I was able to reconstruct what happened to this small community, very small community, um, that was only 5,000 people at its height. And I think one of the best compliments I ever got um, when I was w working on my dissertation was that a, a man read um, the work and he said, how did you know what happened? You weren't there, but he had been there. So then I knew, okay, I was on the right, on the right track um, and that the research was accurate. Um, and so that was a really exciting moment for me. Uh, and so the story of these people is, is relatively brief. Uh, while there's an ancient, there was a very ancient uh, presence, a Jewish presence in Afghanistan, and then we see an emerging of the community in 1839 from, from Mashhad, from northeastern Iran, where the Jewish community there was all forcibly converted to Islam. Um, now this is the only Jewish community in the world that was forcibly converted out of Judaism that remained intact. This is the only community where almost everybody was able to return to an open practice of Judaism over a hundred years later. In that way they're very different from the converso communities that we see that came out of the Inquisition. And the reason that the Mashhad community was able to maintain Judaism was because of the controls that Shia Islam placed um, between private and public and men and women. And so private space is private and outsiders, non-family members cannot enter the home and certainly not in the women's part of the house. And that enabled hidden Jews, crypto Jews, to maintain religious practices and to keep up with, the, with being Jewish and praying and being part of a Jewish community even though they w had formally converted to Islam. And when you convert to Islam, if you try to convert to another religion, or reconvert, to go back, the penalty is death. So it was a very dangerous risk they were taking, but because of the ways of the Shia society in the early 1800s, that was, they were able to navigate this world. Um, and so some of the things they would do was they would put an old woman at the door. And so no man would go through the threshold. And inside the room would be men praying, doing services, having religious services. But because a woman was outside, that was not a place that men were allowed to, to go in. So anyway, so while some of the community in Mashhad stayed in Mashhad, 
and stayed there until uh, certainly 1950s at least. Um, some of them just found it intolerable and quickly moved and quickly fled from the Persian Empire and they went into Afghanistan and settled in the first city that they found, which was Herat, um, in, in western Afghanistan, northwestern Afghanistan, and started a community there. And uh, sometimes um, they would, we have some accounts of Jews and Turkmens working together, fighting against the Persians, because neither group really liked the Persians very much at that time. And then the second wave that we see is a large influx of people into Afghanistan was in the early 1930s when there was um, Stalin's terror and, and millions and millions of people were starving to death in the Soviet Union and the restrictions were horrific um, for everybody and so Muslims, Jews and Christians all fled south into Afghanistan and uh, Muslims were welcomed into the into the northern tier of Afghanistan and allowed to work and settle and live there. Christians were sent to, were considered a, a, quite a threat and they did not fare well at all. And Jews, it was in between. Um, they were tolerated but really not helped at all and um, later faced, and then when their numbers became larger, about 2,000 people, then there was a pressure uh, and they were told that they could not stay any longer in the northern part of the country, but that they had to go to Kabul and Herat. And they were confined again to sort of like an open air prison, to like a car an old caravanserai. Mm -hmm. And many of them died of the conditions as well, but they weren't outright killed. Um, and so that's, those are the two sort of like waves of immigration that happened in Afghanistan. And this community were traders, and they traded with um, the nomadic peoples in the northern part of the country, as well as Turkmen um, shepherds who um, raised caracal lamb, caracal skin, um, uh, fur, caracal fur, which is a black curly wool um, or hide. And that was, at the time, the leading export crop for Afghanistan, the leading way that Afghanistan received um, foreign currency. And second was dried fruit, um, mulberries, apples, cherries, etc. Um, Jewish families, the way that they lived, their domestic situations were very different than other communities. So what we see is in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we see that women remained in the large cities. They remained in Herat and Kabul. And the men traveled out to live in rural areas and, and to trade, and to work as merchants, and to trade with the Turkmen shepherds, um, with caracal skins, and to live in these remote communities, or far communities, in northern Afghanistan. And, um, Eventually, over time, they became more settled um, by probably the 1920s and 30s, then women started to live in those communities year-round. But before then, what would happen is the men lived in those communities and the women lived in the cities. And the men returned twice a year for a month for the Tishrei holidays, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Simchat Torah, and then for Passover for a month. And the rest of the year, they were gone. So we had these households that were mostly run by women. And then when boys got to be early adolescents, then they would join their fathers. And the, But the reason why this story, um, the story of, of this people has been able to be told is because the Afghan community, Afghan Jewish community, were merchants and traders internationally. So what happened was eventually that there would be like a family with three or four brothers and each brother would go to a different city. So one would be in Kabul, one would be in Bombay, and one might be in Leipzig or in, in London. And then they would trade with each other. So the trade routes were based on family ties.
And because of that, the, when things got to be difficult in the early 1930s, 1933, 1932, in Afghanistan, the, the siblings that were inside Afghanistan sent letters out. And that's how the story was preserved in the Western archives. And that, that's the reason why I was able to read about what, what happened. So what happened? So what happened to this community? And um, from about 1933, uh, there, the central government um, decided that they wanted to have this economic peace. They wanted this, uh, the economic role of the Jewish trader and the Turkmen um, uh, like rancher or, or shepherd, that the government wanted that trade and wanted, wanted to be able to earn hard currency for, you know, for the export trade. And so things got to be very difficult. Um, the Jews were told that they had to leave the entire northern tier of the country and return to their places of birth. So as you know, their places of birth were either Herat or Kabul, because th that's where women lived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries only. But by the time 1932, 33 came around, full families had settled in the north. So they were expelled from that area, and they had to return to Herat or Kabul, and they lost everything. And um, and they had to walk, it was September, October, but it was already cold and the conditions were already poor. Um, and then in the summer of 1935, there was a pogrom in Herat. And so the, again, the, the Jewish community had to, fled from Herat to Kabul. And so by about 1935, that was the main center of, of Jewish residents in Afghanistan. And it was very difficult because um, Jews could not be traders by themselves. They couldn't go into business alone. They had to have a Muslim uh, like facade, right? So what they'd do is they'd take a Muslim partner and teach the Muslim partner how to do the business, how to do all the work. And eventually the Muslim partner would go off and do the work by themselves. But this allowed the Jewish um, business person to continue to work clandestinely um, because many of the trades were just were were forbidden at this time and also by the so by about the mid 30s the Jews the Jews started to flee into British India into um, Peshawar and then into Bombay and um, where eventually by the 1940s they were camped out in a Bombay synagogue courtyard and that's where eventually Israel came when Israel was established and picked them up in an airlift and then stopped in Yemen and then went to Israel for magic carpet. So eventually um, the Jewish community, they fled to Bombay and also interestingly to Mashhad, back to Mashhad, um, where they were cared for again uh, later um, by the hidden Jewish community there. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the community was gone by the 1960s, and certain by 67, by 70, they were gone, and um, certainly by the time the Soviets invaded. And, and as you know, the last man left a few weeks ago, Sebulon Simantov. Um, so it was a relatively short history, but uh, there are members of the community in New York, there's a community in New York and in Israel, and really working to preserve some of the, the knowledge, customs, trying to have um, museum exhibits. Also, when the Americans were in Afghanistan, there was a, an effort to preserve Jewish sites. Then on the other side, um, the Persian-speaking Jews in France were not um, did not experience the Holocaust. They were protected from the Holocaust because of the efforts of an Afghan diplomat and a Georgian diplomat, um, who, diplomats who worked very hard to say, no, 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 these people are only Jewish in religion only, but they're not ethnically Jewish, and they're ethnically Aryan. And so this work protected the community, about 100 people who were not 
and um, who were able to survive World War II in France. But then what happened when the State of Israel was created was then there was a huge wellspring kind of, of Zionist um, fervor that uh, went through the entire Afghan community. And we have these extraordinary letters that they write to the government of Israel. And so they really, really wanted to get to Israel. And, but they weren't allowed to until 1955, when the king, Muhammad Zahir Shah, allowed, um, what did he say, he called it like a dignified um, exit from Afghanistan, meaning there were to be no planes arriving, picking up everyone en masse. People were to leave in the normal ways through buses and, you know, and, and then to, to leave through other countries. And, there, and they were not to leave through Afghanistan directly. But he allowed this to happen, and most of the community left in 1955. Um, and we believe that part of the reasons that he allowed the community to go was that he saw the Jews as his ancient kinsmen, and that the Pashtun, some of the Pashtun tribes used to be lost, the lost tribes of Israel, used to have Jewish heritage. Um, Durani, Yusuf Zai, and Afridi um, tribes. And so he was acknowledging them as being part of, you know, part of his ancient kind of Pashtun tribe. And that's why, that's part of the reason why they were allowed to leave. Zahir Shah was very kind to the Jewish community, um, and he would inquire of the children, were they being well treated in school, were they being bullied, if there was to be any problem, he wanted to know about it. Um, and so, for example, I, I interviewed one elderly woman in Israel, and she kept a picture of Zahir Shah. That was one of the very few things that she took out of Afghanistan with her, and that she kept, you know, to this day. So that's interesting how uh, one, you know, the, the Pashtun ethnicities belief about their own ethnogenesis impacted the way that Jews were treated. So Zahir Shah also sent guards to protect the synagogues in the 1956 and 1967 wars um, so that there wouldn't be um, the pogrom, there wouldn't be the tax on the community that had occurred period, you know, throughout uh, the modern history of Afghanistan. Traditionally, women wore a different color burqa than um, Muslim women. So it would have been, I think it was white instead of light blue. And so they were a target in the street. Um, and there were, and then when there were riots, like in 1935 in Herat, then you know, women and children particularly were at very grave risk um, of being raped and kidnapped and um, forcibly converted and there were absolutely episodes of all of this that were documented by the community that were described by the community yes so it was not an easy place to live and throughout afghan jewish history modern jewish history that has been punctuated by times of persecution and then similarly the young woman that I wrote you about from, oh, I told you, excuse me, I told you about first from 1953, who, um, who was also, didn't come home from school one day. So let me tell you about her a little bit more. Well, she was kidnapped, oh, it was November of 1955. And she was a 13-year-old who had been kidnapped um, by a family who we believe wanted to marry her to their son. And so, so they, they had locked her up and they denied her any food or bedding. And she was beaten with canes and was compelled to accept the Muslim faith. She was further told that she had already been declared to having accepted Islam. And she would now, and if she now said that she wanted to become a Jew again, she would be tortured, treated by big brick bats and stones and killed in this way. The information was leaked out to us from the lockup that my daughter, so the, the father is writing this letter, was in great trouble and in a very helpless condition. So he went to the deputy prime minister of Kabul and, and, and asked for help, but nothing happened. 
and then he visited the king's summer palace in Pagaman and presented a petition to Zahir Shah in a street procession. And the next day, he was summoned to the garden, and after a few hours, it was, it was agreed that Tova would be returned to her family. Um, but it took some more time, and, he still, and she still wasn't returned. But he didn't know what to do, and he writes, quote, I am a middle-class man and have totally spent all of my resources to get back my beloved child. We are totally upset with her separation and her torture and distress. I have been threatened that if I took any further steps to get back my daughter, the, Mah the Mohammedans, the Muslims at Kabul, would attack all Jews and kill them all. So I have neither the strength nor voice and influences. There is no de democratic or lawful rule in Kabul where I could place my grievance and be heard. There, I therefore humbly approach and request Jewish brethren outside to use all means at their command to restore my beloved child to me. And we really don't know. And then we didn't know what happened to her. Um, there was very little um, that that was written, and I I thought I'd never I was never going to learn what happened to her. But instead, when I was interviewing this elderly lady, Leah Deal, she said, "Oh yes, um, eventually." She, the family, though the entire Jewish community paid bribes to officials, and on that evening she was returned to the community. And she eventually um, emigrated to Israel, where she lived out her days. So that was a successful story of, of at the very end of the community's history, they were able to rescue their lost daughter. Um, and that's but one of many, many stories. <laughs>